theory is let me tell you quickly what it is we try to do here. In the first video, we're going to cover the rules to the game we'll be playing. In the second video, we're going to show you how you would set up your first game. And then the rest of the videos are dedicated to actually watching the game played. Uh, our hope here is that by watching it played, you'll be able to determine for yourself whether or not this game would be a good fit for you or your gaming group. I recognize there's already a great selection of videos dedicated to reviews for games. And I'm just hoping that our video series really helps complement that. I find when I watch reviews, what usually happens is I find there's about 10 to 20, 30 to 40, 50 to 60 games that suddenly I'm interested in. And I'm thinking, this might be a great game. So I just want to help complement those videos by taking it a little bit deeper. So if this is a game that you might be interested in, what we hope is that you won't just only learn the rules or see the quality of the components, but you will actually get a sense of what it would feel like to play the game yourself. And, and hopefully that will get you off the fence about whether or not this game would really be a good fit for you. We also try to encourage player interaction by allowing you to play along with us. If it's possible, we'll set up a player in the game that is controlled by submissions we get through the YouTube channel from you guys to us. And so if you look at our previous series, that's what we've done. In this particular series here, in the game we're about to do, that probably won't work as well. But we still hope that you get that interaction by being able to ask us your questions and, and give us your feedback. All right, so that's what we're about. Now, what's this game about? Well, this is the Lord of the Rings, the card game. It's by Fantasy Flight Games, and it's a living card game. Living? <laughs> no, it's, it's not alive. You're not going to have to feed or care for it. What they mean by a living card game is that you're going to get a core set like this that has everything in it that you need to play. And then on a regular basis, they release these adventure packs, which are expansions to the game. So the game is going to grow or live over time. And now the difference between uh, a living card game and a collectible card game, well, there's, there's a few differences, but one of the biggest ones is with a collectible card game, you're usually buying packs of cards and you don't know what's going to be inside each pack. With this game, when you buy your core set, it's going to have the exact same cards in your core set that my core set has. And your adventure pack, when you buy the Hunt for Gollum adventure pack, it's going to have the exact same cards in it that mine does. So there's not going to be that random element to the cards that you get. You can always be assured you're going to have a complete set. Now that's not necessarily better or worse than a collectible card game. That's just a different style of play. Sometimes it can be fun. You might enjoy that randomness to a collectible card game. But if that's something that hasn't appealed to you or you'd like to try something different, this does provide a unique experience. In particular, the game is scenario driven. So when you buy your expansions, you're not just adding to the collection of cards that you have to play from and the variety that comes from that. You're also getting new scenarios and new uh, challenges to attempt to complete in your gameplay. The core set is designed for one to two players. I'm going to be showing you guys the single player experience. The two player game is very similar in terms of the rules. The biggest difference is you're going to have someone to partner with to help you achieve your objective. And more importantly, you're going to have someone to blame when you lose because this game is tough. Um, to begin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the components. We're going to look them over together and I'm going to talk to you about the rules that each of the components brings to the game. Now, it's not going to be important to absorb all of these details. I'm hoping that you'll just pick up on a few keywords. This game, I think, is best learned by watching it played. So the overview will just get you familiar with the cards and the components, but you're really going to figure out how the game comes together when you see it played. Now, normally in these games, you get to see lots of me. I think for a card game like this, I'm going to reposition the camera so it's facing the table, and you're going to be able to follow along and see everything up nice and close. All right, the first component, my hands. You're going to be seeing lots of these. They are not supplied with the game. You'll have to get your own. But the first thing we'll want to look at that is supplied with the game are the quest decks. These quest decks are small decks made up of quest cards. The game is scenario driven. So at the beginning, you'll be picking a scenario and then grabbing the quest deck that goes with that scenario. So your objective in the game is to work through the objectives on each card, and if at least one player can finish the final objective on the last card, then you will have won the game. So to begin, let's take a closer look at the individual cards in a quest deck. As I mentioned, the scenario is defined by the quest cards in your quest deck. And you can match the quest cards to the scenario by looking at the subtitle here. This is the name of the scenario, Passage Through Mirkwood. The cards also have their own individual titles, but the main thing you're going to want to pay attention to is the numbers over here. This allows you to know what order to place the quest cards in your quest deck. You always have the lowest number on top. They also have an A side, and if you flip the quest card over, 
There's a B side. We'll get to that in a moment. First though, you should notice there's a bit of flavor text and more importantly, setup instructions. So this might give you additional information on how to set up your specific scenario. You're also gonna to wanna to pay attention to the scenario symbols shown here on the card. These symbols let you know which cards to put in your encounter deck. Your encounter deck is gonna be full of monsters and threats and things that are gonna to try to prevent you from completing your quest. We're gonna look at those cards in a little bit. But you should know that your game comes with a variety of encounter cards and you don't use all of them for each scenario. You only use the encounter cards that match the symbols here. Once you've used this first card to create your encounter deck and set up your game, you're gonna end up flipping it over and that's when the quest is really gonna begin. You're gonna get a little bit of more flavor text, but then you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this number here. These are known as quest points. And in order to be able to complete this stage of the quest, you're gonna to have to place a number of quest tokens on the card in the amount that is shown here. So once you get eight of these progress tokens on the card, then you will have completed this stage of the quest. You'll be able to discard this quest card and move on to card number two. We'll talk more about how you get progress tokens on the card, but that's enough of an overview of this card that we can go on to the next component. These are the wicked and horrible encounter cards. Trust me, you will grow to respect and fear them as you learn to play this game. I've organized them here into different piles based on their encounter set icon. These are the icons that you find on the first card in your quest deck to help you know which of these piles to put together to form your encounter deck. The quest deck we looked at before would have been only made up of three of these different piles of cards. That's not even half of what's available in the box, so you can really get a sense of how much variety and how different each scenario could potentially be. Let's take a closer look at what kind of cards are in the encounter deck. Here I've taken the encounter cards that match the spider symbol and broken it down to the three main types of cards that appear in that series of encounter cards. There is one other kind of card, it's called the objective card, but we won't encounter that in our first scenario, so I'm not going to talk about that right now. These are the enemy cards. These represent the monsters and foes that are going to attack you and that you may have to attack and defeat on your way through your quest. These are location cards. They represent ominous threats, sometimes off in the distance that you must travel to in order to complete your quest. And these are treachery cards. Enemy cards and location cards come into play, and they're bad, but they're not always going to immediately affect you. Treachery cards are like instant effects that usually have a negative impact on your gameplay and they happen and resolve right away. Before we move on to the next card type, I'd just like to show you a couple key things about enemy and location cards. All right, let's look at this cute little fella, the King Spider. The first number I wanna point you to is this one up here. It's the engagement cost. When enemies come into play, they aren't always immediately going to attack you. To find out if they're going to attack you during a turn, you have to look up here at the engagement cost. And depending on this number, it may or may not engage you during that turn. The number two here represents the threat strength of this enemy. When enemies aren't attacking you, they're representing a threat, which will slow down your progress on your quest. We'll look at how that works more later in the game. The number three here represents the attack strength of the character. When enemies are fighting you, you'll be comparing their attack strength against your defensive strength. The enemies also have a defense strength, and that's shown here. The King Spider has a defense strength of one. The enemies also have hit points, shown here. The King Spider has three hit points. So when you're attacking an enemy, if you cause them damage, you'll be able to put damage tokens on the card. And once you're able to put three damage tokens on the King Spider, that would remove it from play. Another important part of the card is the traits here, listed as creature and spider for this enemy. Those are important because some cards in the game will affect specific traits, such as spider cards. The rest of the text featured here is the game text. This is very important. Some of them will have effects like listed here when revealed. This will happen as soon as this card is revealed in play. Other times they have special abilities that they can use when they're attacking you or to hinder you. And some of the cards will have this shadow effect icon. This comes up in combat and we'll look at that later. Location cards like the Mountains of Mirkwood bring their own form of torture and torment to you in the game. They also have a threat strength, just like you'll remember our creature cards have a threat strength here. Location cards also have a threat strength. But of particular importance is their own questing points. Remember when we looked at the quest deck, quest cards had quest points as well. 
So during the game, sometimes you'll be placing progress tokens on your quest deck, and sometimes you'll be trying to place them on the location cards. In this case, you would need to put three progress tokens on this location card to complete it and be able to remove it from play. And they have game text, which often takes place at different times during the game, but we'll look at that more later. These clever looking components are your threat trackers. The game comes with two of them, so that if you're playing with two players, each of you will get one. And if you look closely, you'll see they have little dials on the side that you can spin, and this will allow you to keep track of your current threat level. This is important because if your threat level ever reaches or exceeds 50, you automatically lose the game. So during the game, things are gonna happen that are gonna cause this to go up, and hopefully occasionally to go down. It doesn't start at zero. The number it starts at will be based on the heroes that you choose to adventure with. And speaking of which, wouldn't it be nice to finally look at some components in the game that are actually going to help us on our quest? And that's what we have here, our player decks and our heroes. The core set comes with these four pre-constructed 30 card player decks. They also have three hero cards each. These decks are organized by their spheres of influence. That's these symbols shown down here in the bottom left-hand corner of these cards. There are also neutral cards that don't belong to any particular sphere of influence. Part of the fun and challenge to a game like this is to rip the starter decks apart. Well, not individual cards, but to deconstruct the decks and mix and match and, and get new cards from the expansion sets and put them into your decks. Tournament decks are considered to be 50 card decks that have no more than three copies of any individual card in them. So as you play, you will be able to change your player deck, swapping cards in and out, trying to find that perfect balance to conquer those difficult scenarios. When we begin playing our scenario, I'm just gonna be picking one of these simple pre-constructed decks, and you'll be able to see how the game plays out of the box, but keep in mind you are gonna be able to radically change your gameplay and your game style based on how you mix and match these cards. And if you buy expansions, based on the kinds of cards you'll be able to add to your decks in the future. So let's take a closer look at some of these cards. So I've taken one of the decks and broken it down to the four main kinds of player cards. These three cards here are hero cards, you also get ally cards, attachment cards, and event cards. The hero cards are arguably the most important cards you're going to be playing with. They will generate the resources required to pay for and bring out most, if not all, of the other cards in your player deck. Also, in order to play the other cards in your player deck, you're going to have to have heroes that come from the sphere of influence that match the other cards in your deck. Let's quickly look at the hero cards up close. So this is Gimli, and he comes from the Tactics Sphere of Influence. And I should have mentioned that different spheres of influence really represent different styles of play. So the Tactics deck is made up of a lot of the cards for fighting. So if you know the books or the movies at all, you won't be surprised to find Gimli and his axe in the Tactics deck. So the first number we'll look at here is the number 11. This represents the threat cost for Gimli. At the beginning of the game, you're going to have three heroes in your party, and you're going to total up their threat cost, and that will be the starting number that you put in your threat tracker. So depending on the heroes you choose, you may start with a higher or lower threat level. The number two, just below the threat cost here, represents your willpower strength. You will use that willpower strength to attempt to collect progress tokens that you can place on your quest cards. We'll talk more about how you do that later in the series. The next statistic here represents your attack strength, so you'll use this when you're fighting enemies. And you also have a defense strength, which you use when you're trying to block enemy attacks. The last number here represents your hit points, and like enemies during the game, if you take damage, you will place damage tokens on your card, and once you have received five damage tokens, your hero will be eliminated from the game. Also, similar to enemy cards, you have traits listed here. Gimli is a dwarf, a noble, and a warrior. And you have game text. These are usually special benefits that you can take advantage of during the game. Also, during every turn, your heroes will generate one resource token each, which will go into a little resource pool. Unspent tokens remain so that in future turns, you may be accumulating a nice little pile of resource tokens underneath your hero. Your heroes are always available to you right from the beginning of the game. The rest of the cards in your player deck are shuffled and placed face down. And during your turns you'll be able to draw new cards, and some of the cards you might draw are ally cards like these ones here. 
Ally cards function very much like heroes. They do not generate resource tokens, but they have similar kinds of statistics on them. They have a cost, which is shown here. You would use the resource tokens generated by your heroes to pay for these cards and put them into play. They also have a willpower strength, so you can use them on quests. They have an attack strength and defense for fighting, and they have hit points. They also have game traits and, of course, game text that allow them to do special abilities. You may also draw attachments from your player deck. These cards go directly on your characters, which could be heroes or other allies that you bring out, and it gives them a benefit of some kind. You'll notice that the costs of these different cards can vary quite a bit, so sometimes at the beginning of the game you won't have enough resource tokens to pay for these cards, and it'll be important for you to manage your resources effectively to be able to play the cards you want when you want to. Lastly, your player deck will also have event cards like these. These are cards that you can play during your turn or during other players' turns that usually give an instant benefit and then are discarded. Some cards you'll notice don't even have a cost. This card would not require you to spend any resource tokens to bring it into play. But you would need to pay attention to the sphere of influence on the card. If you did not have a hero in your party that matched this sphere of influence, then even though this card costs nothing, you would not be able to bring it into play. Some cards are also considered neutral. This is an ally card that does not belong to any specific sphere of influence. This means the Gandalf card can be played in any deck. As long as you can pay the cost of five resource tokens, it doesn't matter what sphere of influence your heroes are. And last, we have the first player token. This only comes up in a two-player game. It allows you to know who is going to be acting first during the round. And then at the end of that round, you would pass the token over to the other player. And then that person would get to act first during the subsequent round. All right, that's all the components in the core set. If I have succeeded, then at this point, you should have no idea how to play the game. <laughs> Don't worry. Hang in there. The only thing you need to get from that video was a general sense of the components, how they're laid out, some of the key words. As long as you have some of that somewhere in your head, then in a very short while, we'll be playing the game and it'll all come back to you, I promise and make a lot more sense. So in the next video, I'm gonna show you how to set up a scenario. It's really easy, I promise. And then I hope you come back because we're gonna start the actual gameplay videos. Those are gonna be a challenge for me to create, I know that, but I hope they're gonna be really interesting for you to watch and really show you how this game works. I hope you stick around for that and we'll see you then.